and and I'm I'm curious now with the relationship that you build with payers and um, how you work, you know, the the network that you're building with providers and and your relationship with policyholders. What is that business model for you? Because for most of telemedicine services, it just seems fee for service. There's yeah, no referral fees. You don't make any commission off of uh, pharmaceuticals, or most say you shouldn't. Um, it, it seems very, very simple structure. And I'm, I'm just curious, what, given the complexity and well, also the simplicity of your platform, what, what is, it, is, it, is it different and how does it yeah. change? No, no, so we've refused that. Um, I, it was a strategic decision we had to make as a company. Do we just go out there and just give everything away for free, even to people that could pay and, and think it would work and then hope to figure it out later? And we opted not to do that. We decided to stay lean, to burn, relatively speaking, a lot less capital and to walk away from partnerships where we didn't find that we had partners that really understood the value we could bring. And the way that they value it is they pay us. Like ultimately, that's how you know. You know, if a partner understands that, and, and the way they pay us is in two forms. They pay us on a per member per month model for every life covered. And it doesn't have to be a huge PMPM, but it has to matter. And then they also pay us a percent of cost savings. I'm right, for the efficiency. The cost savings. Yeah, the measurement's tough. The measurement's tough, and I don't wanna give away too much secret sauce, but sure. you gotta have, first, it, it, all, it, all, it all stems back to building the data loop mm. and having the underlying knowledge architecture we were talking about. Gotcha. So you have to be able, um, you know, we're right now in discussions with a couple of the largest kind of tech companies in the world about trying to figure out how to help insurers solve some of their historic data debt issues. Um, but yeah, the way we figured that out was we, we came up, we, we come up with a, you know, traditional risk sharing agreement right up front with the, the, the uh, insurer at a condition and procedure level of granularity. Hmm. Interesting. And I, I feel like, especially for in certain markets like the U S that's the biggest, you know, companies might have a different back end and structure, but, those that uh, seem to survive are the ones that have a, an integrated relationship with payers. Um, yeah, you have to, they have the yeah. wallet. I don't mean the wallet. I, I, I don't just mean like they have money. I mean, they're controlling the flow. It, one of the saddest realizations that I came to, because after I was sitting there in the, in the ICU after the transplant, I still couldn't figure out because I always ask myself, how is it possible that the consumer experience could be as bad as the one that I just experienced. Like what allowed that evolution to happen? It's easy just to get cynical and say, oh, they're just all screwed up. But there's always reasons that drive all of these things. And my conclusion is, is that in healthcare, the consumer, the patient largely doesn't matter, unfortunately, because of third party payment intermediation. Hospitals respond to who writes the checks. And that's governments, it's large employers, and it's, or, or the brokers that represent them, and it's insurance. Hmm. So that's why the patient experience has been set up this way. The auto industry, in contrast, Ford Motor Company cares a lot about getting intermediate markers out there that allow you to measure the Bronco versus the Jeep. Hmm. Like they care about it because they know you're writing the check. Healthcare didn't work that way. And this is one of the beauties, you know, to make any really successful company take some luck. Like there's gotta be some luck in there. And that's one of the hardest things is you do everything you can to the best of your ability. And then you gotta have a little luck. We had some luck launching this in Singapore because the regulatory environments in Singapore and Malaysia and Hong Kong and Thailand and Indonesia, they all have robust regulations, but because they're smaller countries, the special interest isn't the same as in the US. And that's given us the ability to gain adoption and get the genie out of the bottle with some of the global insurers. And once they see this, they'll be the ones to bring us to the U.S. I'm not going to go to the U.S. and launch an office in Palo Alto and say, hey, here I am. You know, I'll be going in with a giant pair that has leverage in the industry that allows us to bring patient empowerment. Because the future of insurance has to be about creating these closed data loops. And it has to be about steering medical intent on data. I mean, this is so obvious if you think about it. 
in, in any other industry, this would be just, but because there's all these hurdles in healthcare, there aren't groups that have put it all together. Yeah. And I, I, I and I'm assuming the reason why the payer chooses to work with you versus any other platform or solution is because you have that robust back end where you can prove the quality of service and price by having this data database that you've built with working with the right providers. Yeah, I didn't start out wanting to do telemedicine at all. I didn't see a lot of value in it. I, I didn't, the only reason we got into telemedicine is we realized that particularly for things like data security and privacy, and particularly because there's so many conflicting, is you have to understand the, the, ins the insurance ecosystem, when the insurance companies, when they're trying to build these digital ecosystems, it, you can't take a bunch of starving startups and, all, and any well-run startup is starving, right? So you can't take a bunch of starving startups, put them into an eco, put them, in, put them together into different facets of a consumer journey, assume they're all gonna get along, they're all gonna transfer the data stably, and it's all gonna work out. Like that's just never, and then not pay any of them enough to make them secure in that relationship. And that's kind of the way the insurance companies have historically gone about trying to build their ecosystems, particularly in Asia. So we just took a step back and we said, hey, that'll never work. We're getting out of any of those relationships and we're just gonna build all the pieces we need to be effective so that not only do we know the data is secure, not only do we know the patient experience is secure, but we can also show you that there's no conflict of interest and we can show you the cost savings. And so telemedicine is really important because you, that's where 80%, that's basically where 80% of your flow comes in the door in the beginning. That's how they get to know about you. That's how they understand you exist. So you need to give them a delightful experience, even if you never make any money from it. And so the telemedicine standalone companies, they're all having to figure out if they can get kickback referrals from specialists in some other way, right? So you, you gotta, the insurers benefit from an integrated system that is all focused on cost reduction and improved quality and delightful experience, mm. right? They're just, they're just coming to grips with that. It takes time. These companies are huge and they move like battleships. And so, you got to become a solution provider as opposed to a technical architect for them because they're not, they're only slowly getting to that level of understanding mm -hmm. what that means. But we've come to the conclusion it has to be an integrated offering mm -hmm. um, and it has to be focused on cost. 